Okay, this is Eric Deloach uh, with another edition of American Authors and Others. We have a special guest and we are blessed today, but at this special time, let's allow her to introduce herself and we'll go from there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mahogany Silverain and I'm an author of paranormal interracial romance books and also a show host uh, of a host a show called Mahogany Says where I interview authors and editors and people who promote others or promote authors as well. And it's uh, on every Thursday night. So it's it's been interesting how everything has kind of grown from there, but also into publishing. So, and my business is called Mahogany's Place. Great. Well, this, our tradition on the show kind of is just, tell us where you were born and where did you grow up? This is kind of the general question for the authors, because I know people, they <laughs> love to know this little information. Yes. I was born in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, actually, and uh, I left when I was very young. So I spent most of my formative years in San Antonio, Texas, where I went to high school and then college and in the military. Okay. Okay. Um, were, were there any sayings from your, from your, let's say, from your mother, father, grandmother, grandfather that were instilled in you at a young age that have, I guess that have been positive, that have had some type of influence that you remember, you know, it still kind of stick with you today? Uh, see, the big one of my grandfather was uh, don't give up and just keep pushing. No matter what happens, just keep going. And even if it looks like you might lose, then you got to put your best effort. Wow. And so that's why I, I took that and ran with it. Do, do you remember how young you were when, when, um, when he, he said first, that? Yeah, when he started saying that. I was probably junior high. Okay. Like sixth or seventh grade. Okay. Because I was really upset about something uh, that I had failed a test or something. And he's like, just take it again and do your best. And, you know, don't, don't give up. Keep trying. Wow. And it, and it was, I, I, I take it. It, it really stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. And gave positive results. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and talk to you before you said that you have written s several books. How many books have you written uh, up to this date, I guess? Written and published, uh, published 14. Wow. I've written about 15 uh, wow. or so that uh, there's two products that I'm working on right now. So, but uh, published 14. Okay. So when did you first, when did it hit you to be an author and tell us about the first the first experience of the first book the excitement and you don't know what to expect just tell us <laughs> give us fill us in <laughs> well my first book uh, is uh, ebony encounters and that came about from uh just my sister who my late sister who had passed the year before had actually encouraged me i would tell her stories all the time and she encouraged me to publish and i was really shy about doing that because these were, you know, personal stories and things that I just thought, well, maybe people weren't being interested, but she encouraged me a lot. And after she passed, I decided to honor her by publishing my first book. And my first book was actually a children's book called My Rainbow Family. But I branched out from there and began to write my romance stories. And the first book was like a culmination of three uh, erotic stories that just kind of stuck in my brain. And I wrote them out and it was really interesting that how they came together and ended up being one of them became a series. So uh, I was, I was nervous, but I was excited. And of course you made all the mistakes that you normally do your first time out. And I really didn't understand, you know, the whole business and promoting yourself as well. So it was kind of trial and error, but uh, yeah, it is it's still one of my favorite books because it was my first and it was my baby. When when did okay when did you write this this um I guess this masterpiece? Thank you. That was very generous. But yes. you know, the first book is kind of like yeah, you write that one off because there's so many mistakes. But I really um, came out with it in 2008, but I didn't publish it until 2009. Okay. So it was uh, wonderful to actually get it out there for the first time, and I fell in love with my characters right away. And it was just a kind of a showcase of little pieces of what I had to offer. 
and it just kind of branched out from there. How, how long did it take you to, 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 to write that first book? I mean, you know, from conception to... From conception to actual completion, maybe about a month and a half. Because they were just... Uh, I had so many stories that I wanted to... I wasn't sure which ones I would put in it. And I knew it was probably going to be a, a trilogy or maybe an anthology of different stories. But I, I trimmed it down just three. And uh, they were stories that meant a lot to me. So... And there were parts of my personality, my character, and uh, showcase a little bit of what I could do. So I chose those three, um, The Unexpected Mentor and um, Love Bites. And then the last one was uh, Chocolate Truffle. So those, those were stories that were interesting and based on, actually, Chocolate Truffle is based on real life. So that was the most, uh, that was a story after my heart. Wow. And did you ever at any time prior to writing have, did you have any doubts about, well, I have these ideas, but eh, I don't know what, if, I don't know if this really should be a book. I, if I want to write, and I'm, I'm assuming that the person that you talked about that inspired you said, no, I know you have something great. Go ahead and let the public, you know, know about it. You hear Definitely. that. Yes. Yeah. So did you ever have any? Oh, yeah. You know, like on the big, fence. Big time. <laughs> I was on the fence for a while because they were, uh, I sent my books out to be, you know, published by other publishers and I was told the same thing. I didn't have the cooker cutting version of, you know, just the, the basic premise, the heroine, I'm well, the hero, the damsel in distress, and then they get together and they go through all this. And I, my stories were nothing like that. So at the time they were also interracial and, you know, in 2009, you would think at that time it would have been a little more open, but they were not open to stories of that nature. So that's why I, I chose to publish it myself to get the story out there. But yeah, I had a lot of doubts because I was turned down consistently because I didn't have the typical storyline. I had heroines instead of heroes and uh, she saves him or they come together in a different way or she had more than one partner. So those were not accepted for romance books at the time. So I kind of, with a little ahead of the game, and during that time, there's maybe five of us who wrote interracial stories. And now there's just, it's branched out to be so big now. It's such a huge genre. So I was onto something back then. So I'm glad I didn't give up. And then I went ahead and published it. Okay. And this is the, the interracial, that, that was like the second or third book? Or... Oh, the oh. first book. The very first book, okay. The very first what, book, yeah. What, All what the is, stories mm -hmm. had in common was the interracial thing. Oh, what what brought that about? The the I guess the I guess you wanted to sh talk about something that wasn't talked about and kind of let people see it instead of the just plain Jane regular, you know, uh, same race in, right. I mean, romance. You wanted to what 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 is what sparked that and inspired that. Uh, I was married to okay. uh, my husband was Dutch and Italian, so okay. uh, that was uh, it was based on our relationship and things that I had met with other interracial couples and I interviewed them and asked them how they dealt with things and if they had any stories that they could read about themselves and they said no and I I was like okay well that's what I need to, to write in that it's a need it's it's because there were more interracial couples than people you know thought there would be. And so they also, you know, want to see stories that feature themselves. And that was a, uh, an idea that came to me to do that. And my husband at the time encouraged me to go forward with that. What was the response? I, 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 you did several more, so many other books. So I guess it was positive. But tell me, what was, yeah, what was the response? Uh, the response, I was amazed at the okay. amount of readers who, and people who began to write me and tell me how much they enjoyed the story or how much they related to the story. And of course, I kind of looked for different groups online that maybe would be interested. And so I kind of catered to those groups as well to see, get myself going and, and see if there was any interest. And boy, it was really uh, positive. I, I was surprised. And it was, you know, a little rough on the edges because I was new at the time, but I really enjoyed the fact that 
I was able to join at the time Coffee Time Romance, who included my stories because it was different. It was something new and different. And their readers just kind of latched on to it. And through Coffee Time, I was able to get myself out there even more. And when I started writing more books, they introduced each one. And I had an interview with them. That was my very first interview was with Coffee Time Romance. And they were instrumental in really getting me out there in 2009. Wow. Um, so what are you, is it nonfiction or fiction? And, okay. And are, are you are you talking about even in that setting you're talking about some of the i guess i want to say the trials or some of the, some of the issues that may come along with with um yes with with and and i guess also i i, I kind of sense i could be wrong that that you were you were also trying to help others that were interracial to kind of yes as well so tell us about that this is very exciting i really enjoyed the fact that it was different and some you know some couples they just didn't really want to acknowledge the difference but we had no choice when we were in public it was you know you were on display and most people had something to say some people didn't have anything to say but they would look at you fine so okay. a lot of times we were just stared at uh when i would go with our kids to restaurants people say is this separate checks and i would teasingly tell the kids well i guess you're paying for your own meal but uh <laughs> okay. kind of you know uh it's frustrating at times when people would see us together and still not assume we were. And then they would ask him, can I help you? Can I help you? And he's like, no, we're together. And, but a lot of people, it just went over their heads. And then you get to the point sometimes where my husband would say, look at him, look at her and look at me, you know, <laughs> our children. So it was, you know, we, we are family. Do you ask all families that question, you know? So it was, uh, and living in Georgia made it even more a little difficult because it was in the South and uh, there were people who were not understanding. We've had literally people ask us, uh, ask my uh, husband, did you, you couldn't find a white woman to marry? <laughs> literally say things like that. So it was interesting to find out we would get together with other couples and we would share our stories and our struggles and things that we hoped would change over time. And I wanted to write stories in a positive way so that people who were not interracial couples would come to understand that we have pretty much the same dynamic. It's just that we make different races, but we're still a man and a woman. Right, so right. It's, and, and it's still, we still have the same couple problems as anyone else, but we have the added source of others' prejudices or, you know, beliefs or understandings or their perception of our relationship. Now, how did you, how did you, how did you meet? I mean, you definitely fell in love. Um, I, you had to be, to, to um, enter in, in a racial re, um, relationship, which is, the, the, you know, beautiful, you know, for, for, to each its own, it's beautiful. So, so right. tell us, where did, how did the romance begin? How, how did you, did you meet in college <laughs> or how did you meet? Uh, we met online. Okay. And, uh, it was, um, I can't even remember if it was interracial match or something, but okay. it was, yeah. And it, from the beginning, we just kind of read each other's profiles and we just seemed to have a lot in common and talked quite a bit. So it was kind of meeting from there. He had a daughter, I had children. So it was, you know, we were both single parents. And so we had that in common and there was just, we kind of clicked from there. Wow. You know what sounds interesting to me, I mean, what comes to mind is, would you be interested in doing a documentary to where yeah. you, you know, I just think that that would be even, that would be an extra bonus, kind of a documentary, um, talking to different couples, of course, writing some more books as, as you do, um, but right. a documentary that let us understand and see the human side and some of the nonsense, but see some of the, see the positives and really kind of give people an opportunity <coughs> for some people, but give, <coughs> excuse me, other people an opportunity to, to see the humanity of um, mm -hmm. interracial marriage. And, and, and I guess the ch children that come up and, and how it affects children, right. just, the, just the whole oh. dynamics. I think that would be interesting. Oh, that would be, yes. I would definitely do that. 
because it yeah. was a, a light on, you know, as, as an issue. And we are more after the, was it the 2010 census um, in 2020, there has been an increase in interracial right. marriages. Right. So that, you know, there's, that's why it's a whole, it, the genre has blown up in, in romance and also just the increase of couples who are now looking outside of just their own race to, you know, for love and for marriage. So that, and it, and it brings also a lot of positivity toward black women who were at first not seen as, you know, being uh, the marriage type or eligible for different things, you know, where we are seen also now as equal in that part to, we can be partnered with anyone and not just, you know. So, and, and it gives them hope because a lot of professional black women after a certain age, it tends to be a little difficult to find someone. And, right. you know, I'm living proof because I was late thirties you know, at the time going on 40. And it uh, lets you know that we, we have choices, we have options. And it's right. not that we are stuck being single because, you know, for whatever reason, but that we do have options. Yeah, um, I, I kind of feel that on both sides, on all sides of all, of all groups that um, you just have to find somebody that you definitely would be compatible with, that you fall in love with, and that mm -hmm. color should not be the only determinant to where whether okay it you know that okay it has to just be this or whatever and it's, and there's a limited supply um you should have you should have the ability to find the right match for whatever right. the right match may be mm -hmm. correct and someone who would also understand uh your plight or and and their plight as a you know as a minority because even with white women and black male relationships it is the same as well there, there are things that if she can identify with him and understand his struggles and the same thing with white men and black women we have to he has to identify and you know with our struggles and understand have an understanding of things such as white privilege or things like that to where they would be open to that and you know also be allies and understanding because that would be a huge part of being married to someone of a different color or race. Yeah, I think it has to be an open, open mind and you can have light minds yes. between the races as well. And I think that, I think it's, a, it's kind of small minded to kind of think that, okay, just because this person is just my same race, that's the only person that can understand me that can love me and appreciate me for, for being who I am. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, we find that there are lots of people that can understand and relate to. And there are lots of beautiful, we call them Blasian couples. There are Asian and black couples that are just beautiful. They can understand each other's, you know, and identify with each other. So yes, there, I mean, there's a huge uh, following in that as well. And we call it, uh, AMBW, which is Asian male and black women, there's a whole movement of that as well in interracial right. romance. Right. And um I, I, I would assume, I mean, I myself have been in you know various interracial relationships in the past. So I I know that you can really get to learn different cultures and it's yes. so much to learn, uh, you know, that that um you may not get the chance if, if it's if it's just the same race not to say that that's the reason for for it, but right. i'm saying there are some other interesting um benefits and things that can come along yes yeah that's right right, right. We're, you know we're we're different but we also have some of the same interests or things we may like to do and you know where you can relate on those things right i mean and you maybe have different music types or whatever but then they get a chance to hear your music and you get the, you know, that you may have liked and, and love and you hear theirs and then you get a, a broader appreciation for more, more things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I've always so, been eclectic in my music. So everything from the Beatles to yeah. um, like White Snake and <laughs> R&B and just, you know, so I, and some hip hop, I not, that fond of the newer ones, but uh, right. old school, you know, 80s, you know, hip hop, I, was, I still love that. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, we, because I lived one time before in San Francisco, did, did you, do you think that uh, location can play a factor in happiness of an uh, interracial couple? You know, if there's, I mean, like California as opposed to Georgia? I, I think so. There would probably be a lot more in California. Uh, Georgia, they're still getting in, you know, this mindset of, okay, they're starting to open up and, you know, be open to that. However, when we first moved there, it was, you know, it's still a stigma thing and people aren't understanding. And, but then there are also people who are just genuinely curious and ask questions and you have to be open enough to answer their questions without, you know, being defensive or anything, because honestly, some people just aren't sure and they wanna know what's, you know, that is possible. And then some people are just really like, oh, you know, I, I wanted to see that when I was younger, but I thought it would be, you know, uh, it's too much. And how do you handle the pressure or the things that you come against? And uh, there are some really older people who really uh, became inspired because they saw us and they talked to us. And after speaking with us, they say, okay, I see why you two are together. And it made them change how they felt or how they viewed things. And some were even open to having their biracial grandchildren to whereas before they weren't too sure where their son and daughter had, you know, been with someone else and, or, of a different race. And then now they have these biracial children. And now they are more loving and accepting toward these biracial children because they have a more understanding of the whole dynamics of the, the relationship. So I think it was a positive influence on some people. Absolutely, absolutely. Now. What's the current book that's out now? Or the late, the um, most recent book, if you will. The most recent book would be uh, The Desert, uh, Desert Flower. And okay. it was from a Once Upon a Villain series that I, I wrote with several other authors. And okay. I was book number three. Okay. And uh, it's based on villains from different stories. And my villain uh, was Jafar from Aladdin. If you remember Jafar, well, in order to keep uh, Disney off of me. I had to rename him Jabbar okay. and give him a backstory. Okay. And he falls in love with uh, a woman who is uh, her, her mother is from Africa and her father is from the Middle East. And okay. she has this beautiful brown skinned woman who looks more Ethiopian. And he, this is the person he wants to marry, but he's a villain. And he is given a second chance, uh, a redo, so to speak, to where no one would know his evil deeds and he would be able to establish himself with the princess. And, you know, that's, that would be his love story. However, he messes up within the first 20 minutes. <laughs> first <laughs> so 20 he, minutes. Whoa. Oh, yes. He, the, the, the first time he was just, he still had a lot of hatred in his heart for her father who uh, had done some things wrong and, you know, was indirectly yeah. responsible for his mother's death. So he kind of held that against him and, and instead right. of, you know, because a lot of villains are made, they're not, you know, some people aren't born bad, they're just, you know, circumstances happen. So I want to show, and the whole purpose of the series was to show how villains can have a happy ending too. So, okay. uh, and how they became villains. And so you kind of root for him to do it again. So he gets a second, another chance. And uh, this time he's like, you know, he messes up again, but later on, <laughs> <laughs> so third, third time's the charm. So right, right. When he really begins to see her for who she is, and realizing that he doesn't have to become this all evil, powerful wizard to have power and to have love in his life, and he was able to forgive. And so I think that it's um, one of those. It's my first fairy tale, mm -hmm. which I really enjoyed writing. Yeah. So, and it was if people love Aladdin. They would really love this one because uh, Desert Flower is based you know, on the story of Aladdin. So even Aladdin might be in it, but it's a different character based on Aladdin. But you can tell, you know, once you start reading it, you'll, you'll figure it out. But it is, is the desert flower and it is only on Kindle right now on Amazon. Yeah, are you, are you thinking about um, potentially that it could be, end up as a film? I was thinking that with, with a lot of my books and I, I do have a novel yeah. series that I would love to see on film. Right. Tell us, well, tell us about, okay, so that, are you currently writing some new books now or? are they Yes, I am currently writing uh, Wolf Daddy, which is a paranormal uh, motorcycle club story. 
and which also features some uh, BDSM, kind of like Fifty Shades of Grey. So okay. it, this will be my second story that will feature some aspects of BDSM, but this will be the daddy dom and little girl aspect. Mm -hmm. So this is it's really cool and it's based on a true story. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, the characters are directly based on myself and uh, my current boyfriend. So, uh, cause I'm divorced now, but uh, okay. it is um, something that I've wanted to do. And it really kind of opened up for me because I do love motorcycles and motorcycle clubs. And I fell in love with Sons of Anarchy and watching the Mayans. So it kind of gave me that inspiration to write this. And there are a few, you know, other motorcycle club stories, but never, um, not too many have a paranormal aspect. So I wanted to add that. So the character is a, a clone of um, a clan of werewolves. So it, I added that into it to make it more interesting. And it stays along with my genre, which is paranormal. Now, when, when the when when the when will we be when will the I guess when we, when will we be blessed with this new book? Uh, hopefully by December. I'm trying to get it um, edited and get everything together and finish writing a lot of things that um, because sometimes I, I've done the outline and you know you write from the outline and sometimes you'll see the characters just like changing like nope that's not what happened and I'm like wait we're not sticking to the <laughs> I had it written down. <laughs> You're just like no that's not what happened so. Yeah, so when it changes like that, I, I listen and it turns out to be a better story. So I'm kind of growing with how my characters are dealing with things and I, I like it. It's just um, the, the book I published last year, um, which was actually Passions Pride Alejandro. Okay. You know, okay. He had, uh, the story was written, I was ready to send, to send it to the publisher and it was, the last minute character popped up. <laughs> okay. He turned out to be very integral to the story. He made a great plot twist. And it was a, a clan of uh, snake shapeshifters. And it, it turned out to be what the book needed. And it became number one last year in November wow. uh, on the list in Hispanic literature. And wow. that floored me because it was based in Sonora, Mexico. And the main character, the protagonist is Hispanic and he is from Mexico. And he is a jaguar shifter and how his people were in a protected area, but there were things that were happening that would threaten where he lived with his uh, village and his tribe. So it was pretty interesting to also show because the Sonoran Desert is the only desert that snows and wow. where they have snow. Left. And jaguars are really rare in the United States, but they are prominent in Mexico and places like South American jungles. So the fact that there was one actually in Arizona that was spotted in the hills gave me the idea for a jaguar story and they called him El Jefe but they found him roaming around in the hills I don't know if he was looking for his mate we, they don't really know but he was the only jaguar spotted in the U.S. and so I saw that news interview and I thought wow that would be a great story for you know a romance story because he actually goes back to Arizona looking for the woman he fell in love with and that's why he was in the mountains looking for her because she went back to the United States. Yeah. Okay. Well, now the obvious question: How did it become number number one? What, what did you? What was your marketing approach? Or just how did what happened? I mean, this is that's very interesting. It, it was interesting. I lowered the price for it to like ninety nine cents. It was like a special for like a week, and I did a lot of advertising in different places, um, from Twitter to Facebook, to, um, all over Instagram, and it was a great promotion because all of a sudden it just kept climbing and climbing and climbing, and I, I it was. I was floored because I do right. have Spanish in the book and I do understand Spanish, but I was surprised that it was in that category for Hispanic literature, uh, being that it's a black author who has no Hispanic <laughs> at all uh, or lineage, but right. that they were so excited about my story and they actually, you know, took to it. So I was really excited about that. And that was my first book to hit a number one spot. So that's that. I mean, I guess that's that's um, attributed to your creativity, at, you know, at yes. being a creator. As a book author, you're a creator. Yes. And yeah, I didn't have to create much uh, based on just the, the landscaping was pretty much there. And, you know, so I created the world around that, the paranormal, which I created within there. 
but also just to appeal to the people and things that really do happen in Sonora. And in how it was during the time that I wrote it, it was a high risk area for people going and visiting Mexico because of the um, drug trade and because of the uh, drug cartels. So I included some of that in the book because it was actually true. So I made it as realistic as I could, but added the fictional elements and that together made a really good story. That could that could be a movie. I mean, it, yes. it, it responds, I mean, you got that response. That That is amazing. That is, I mean, here you are able to create something that touches a lot of people and, and that may not, you know, that are not even probably even Americans or whatever and, and or whatever from, from mm -hmm. South America. So something something happened, something special ha ha happened in that particular, I guess, publishing of the book. Yes. Yeah. He found his own unique way to combat that situation. And I also, you know, brought to light the, the problem of the Sonoran Desert and the conservationists in the area that are trying to conserve that area for the animals that live in that area. So I was able to add a little blurb in the back of the book and it tells you all about it and what organization you can contact if you want to be a part of it and things like that. Now, okay, so let me ask you this and then I ask you that. Um, uh, let me go here. Uh, well, I do remember this. Um, so what is your... And, that's yeah. Let me go here. What what book? I mean, what would be the first book you would recommend for new people that would, I guess, get to be a part of your, you know, of your community of readers um, and buyers of your book? What what would be the what would be the first book that you, if you had a book? Okay, I want you to read this book first, and then you know, and then read of, the course, of course, you're going to read, you're going to get the other books, but what, what, would, be, what would be the start, the great starting point for, for a new reader of yours? Uh, the first book from Passions, my Passions Pride series, which are all about cats. And as you can see, yes, I love cats. So, right, right. <laughs> um, they're cat shifters and uh, Passions Pride, Leonessa was my first one. Mm -hmm. And I really get into, because I wanted to make you feel as if you are there. Right. And that was one of my things. I'm a very, uh, sensory oriented person, uh, smells, tastes, sounds, what you see, everything. So I bring everything to life for you that you feel like you are there. And this one was in Sonora, Mexico. The first one, Leonessa, is in West Africa in the Sierra Leone. And I even researched the accents and the Creole language so that I could get it correct in the book. And it was also a one that I got into, became my first audio book because it was so popular and it was also, now I didn't hit number one like Alejandro, but uh, it was my most popular book. And it continues to be to this day, my most popular because people really got into Leonessa. She was a lion and a lioness, and she lived in a village that was hidden in the African jungle. But she was also a doctor who came out to help the people in the Sierra Leone and be healers and you know contribute to that. So. It's just the way that it, the story is told and how her intended comes to be with her. And it starts as when they were children and she met him as a child. And it just kind of goes from there. And it was just amazing how the two came together and how she actually brings out in him what he didn't know was there. So it is it's one of my, my favorite. And I think if you actually want to understand most of my work, that would be the book to read. Definitely. Hey, Pastor Hopefully we can put it if up to you. You put it, you tell me, um, give me the link actually to Amazon or wherever it is, so that people because mm -hmm. it was great when the, 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 the holiday seasons. So I'm definitely yes. gonna urge all the audience go purchase that book. <laughs> Thank you, you know, go purchase the book. Um yeah, if you want to, you know, she has great writing we see here. Um, what is your what is your process? Now that I mean, because I see that you research, you're in Delft, and I and I have to say this, I see, I, I just envision screenwriter. I just I just envision yes. that is where you have to. I mean, you probably have already been there, but let's just start before we get there. If I jump ahead of myself, uh, myself, or what? And and but what is your process? Because I mean, a lot of new people that that want to, you know, everybody wants to. I mean, it's the coolest thing. 
to be, yes. be to be a writer. And the Beatles, I love the Beatles. Some people may not think I do um, because I had a <laughs> video, but that situation that kind of happened out of my control people. But I do love the Beatles. And by the way, they have a song, I think, called Paperback Writer that you should listen to. Yes. Very, very right. nice song. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what is, because I think you have a unique and a success, some, something very successful going on, a formula or whatever, what is your your writing process? You, you research this. Very, this is very interesting. I love. I've always loved researching and, and reading. Reading was my first love. So anything that I can look up, I can stay in a library all day. <laughs> so okay, it's just fun to look up stuff and and see on any subject that I would think of. And my process is to come up with. Usually, I'm inspired by a character, person, or a storyline. And I'll take it from there and make it my own. And what I'll do is look up different aspects of things that, you know, such as the one I'm working on right now. And I'm looking up MC clubs and how they operate, how, how things are done, and whether I want it to be an outlaw one or one that was more, you know, for show where it's like get together on Saturdays and they ride around their Harleys, whatever. But I want it to be more, you know, more so than that. So I, I look it up and I find out what the rules are, what, what things they do. The places, you know, I look at the area. Uh, this one is based in Colorado because I'm now in Colorado. So I base it here to find out, you know, the different things in the mountains and everything from the weather to the atmosphere to things that happen here naturally, what animals are indigenous to the area. I look at all these things, especially with the fact they're going to be shifters and paranormal aspect of it so that it can flow together and be re more realistic. And that's kind of, I write my outline and like I say, sometimes it doesn't always stick to it, but it gives me something to, to guide, you know, to go along with the story. But uh, I can't always say that all of my outlines, are, I've written it exactly like my outline because there's always something new and interesting that happens. And it's usually like, I think the story is going one way and I'll picture it in my head and then I see it start changing. So I stay open-minded enough to where I can include those changes. And usually it's for the right, you know, it's for the right reason. And it comes up to be very good. So right. I stay open to that process. So I'm not rigid enough to say, okay, I'm just going to stick to the outline. Sometimes it's fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> it's just, so I would be kind of half pantser, half uh, outliner as far as my process goes. And then when I get toward the end, I have my Twizzlers and I have my green tea and just kind of a little ritual I have, you know, when I'm ending the book. So I'm kind of munching on Twizzlers and ending it. <laughs> so <laughs> I know when I get toward the last chapter, that's what I kind of do. Have you ever, because um, I'm a songwriter as well, um, have you ever, a part of a book had, have came to you in a dream? Yes. I, I did have a book that it was totally from a dream. <laughs> and I, I wrote that out. It was kind of crazy, but it actually, uh, back in 2010, it was actually pretty well received. I was shocked that it was because it was more on the, less, the spiritual side. And it kind of floored me because it was not what I expected it right. to be. But I couldn't shake the story and I couldn't get it until I wrote it down. Then I was okay. But it was like it kept gnawing at me and I couldn't get up. I just, I couldn't even leave the bed. Wow. So I sat and I just started typing because I couldn't, didn't do anything else but finish the story. And it was a dream. And while I was writing, it was like I could hear the, the main character's voice. And she just kept telling, you know, this happened here and, and why this happened. And I was like, wait a minute, let me finish this. I couldn't get it down fast enough. So I ended up recording some of it on my phone so I could play it back and then finish typing. But it was um, an earlier book, which is now out of print, but it was a Nama a Succubus Tale. And that was the one, it was a dream that kept me up that I did not, I finished that book in a day and it was no, it took me all day to wow. just, I mean, I sat there, I didn't do anything. I didn't even want to eat. I was just, I had to finish. I had to get it out. And it was, like I said, it was, it was crazy, but it was, it was a risk, but it actually paid off. And so, yeah, that was one of my older books. <laughs> it's one of the first two I wrote. Can you bring that back for the public? I mean, I, I was, 
Uh, I was that... thinking about it, and right now, <laughs> um, I'm actually being encouraged to kind of, you know, bring it back. But because yeah. it's, a, it's a demon, and you know, but she talks about God and heaven and hell and the differences and how this almost, you know, the, it's like a, it reads like a dysfunctional family because they are her her mother is Lilith, her father is Lucifer, but you know, and all her brothers and sisters are all the incubuses and succubuses, and she has this whole world that. Uh, you know, humans are not aware of, so, right. or, you know, and even dealing with angels and things like that. So it kind of gives you a glimpse into that, into that world. And I thought, well, maybe it's too dark. And I thought, well, maybe I'll back off of it because it's kind of dark and it's not my usual work, but I think uh, it would appeal to a lot of people who are, are into the darker things and darker romances. So I will probably touch it up and bring it back, I, I think, and just kind of change some things and rewrite and add more to it and probably bring it back. Sounds interesting. I definitely would be interested in it. <laughs> I would definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you this, jump in here. Now, where you live at now, does that have an impact? Um, like if you, because you said you're in a, in a more, f in Colorado, right? Yes. Yeah. Does that, that space, I suspect, in that I guess even the different environment, does, does that bring out more creativity? Yes, it does, actually. And being in Denver, it actually has been, uh, and I've gone, made trips to the mountains in different areas here because it's, it's so spread out that I've been to different places. And we're like three hours, I mean, not even three hours away from Wyoming. And it's like, so it gave me a little more inspiration to write. And that's why that's right. the current book is based here because it gave me a chance to experience more here. And Denver is one of the most diverse cities here in Colorado. And I've never seen so many people from Africa before. And they're here. And it's interesting to see that. Whereas I, you know, it was Georgia, it was kind of new and different. And I would, I wear a lot of African outfits and I would get stared at a lot, but here it's like, normal so <laughs> to see that and I, I've met so many people here from like Ethiopia and uh different places uh in Africa West Africa and North Africa so it is interesting to see here and uh, so I wanted to kind of write you know about being here and the scenery that I've seen and the people that I've met and uh, based a lot of the characters on the people that I've met here because it is it's like a it's being a different place altogether and I know and there are parts of Georgia that I like but it's really different here and the mentality is so much different than what I grew up with or even yes it's a different world it's a different world most definitely <laughs> and, different. and I do like the snow I mean it's cold but I you know seasoned woman here uh, hot flashes so it's it feels good to me <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever, I mean, maybe you have already, have you ever thought about um, flying to Ghana and staying for like two or three months and just see what, let's see I what happens. I would see that actually and, and spend time in Africa period just learning, uh, you know, about our history and culture and I found out um, descended from a tribe that's in um, West Africa and that my earliest ancestor is from Sierra Leone. Because I've okay. had people read the book that are from Sierra Leone. They read Leonessa and they have written me and actually told me that uh, it reminded them, of, you know, they asked me, had I been there? And I said, no. He said, just by reading the book, I thought you had been here. And I said, no, I have not. <laughs> wow. said, you need to come here because he said, just in the way you spoke, I read on my show, right. I read a passage from it and I used the accent. And he said, it reminded him of home. And he said, even the way that I spoke and the way that I talk about Sierra, as if I had been there, and this is a place that I love. And it was, but it was just in my mind from just reading about it, looking at pictures, and I just took myself there in my mind. And that's what I wrote. And it was really well received. So I do have a whole little fan base in mm -hmm. um, West Africa now in Sierra Leone because of that. And I, it was great to find out after doing my DNA that I did have an original ancestor from the Sierra Leone. So maybe I was channeling her. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was, uh, it's great to find that out. And this was, I wrote Leonessa in 2010 and, and I found out my DNA last year in 2020. So it was interesting to find that out. 
and just to see the correlation and, and the response from that. Yeah. I'm a business guy as well, um, school-wise and stuff like that before becoming Mr. Cre being creative as well. Um, and I say that to say this, since we, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So right. what I'm saying is if you had success with the one book, you know, that was, that became number one, it seems reasonable to me to, to think that maybe another book for the Spanish market. And here we go. Cause I, I don't know, these ideas always come to me off the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. Go over there for about yes. for, 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 for about a month or so and just see what tea leaves transpire and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And another thing, you have a lot of people on the with the YouTube and I mean maybe down the road myself and maybe you as well and you know in your program and stuff like that to actually is it possible to that we could self document our process of writing a book? Yes. You know, like like yeah. like like you go over there and mm -hmm. you try the, the food, try the culture, you and your 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 significant other, and and just meet the people and then you're inspired and maybe you're doing research there as as mm -hmm. just at, not only in the library or in the internet, document it and then write a book and then maybe it's the second thing and then also sell the footage. Uh, I, I, I place the footage on YouTube for people to mm -hmm. respond and, oh, this is a nice place to travel to or whatever. Yeah. I just, yes. you know, I just, I just there, there seems to be so much that you enrich value that you, that you, that you possess and it's, and you, and you're very exciting as an, an author. And I'm really impressed by, um, thank you, the, this research. It's, yes. very, it's very, I mean, this research to where, and, and, and I mean, it's paying off. You're saying that you have this fan base in Africa and they actually thought you were from there. Yes. So that's, that's what I mean, me. that's, that's <laughs> fascinating. Yes. And I, it was, uh, someone interviewed me, uh, was by April Armstrong. She's another um, poetry thing, but I read my book on her show and she had people calling in and that was one of the guys that called in was from. Sierra Leone and he said just listening to me and that's how he, he said I thought I was from there so yeah. it was uh, that was very interesting and I do also book trailers like movie trailers for my books and for other authors books and I show pictures and give a story you know so where they would make it more exciting for them to read the book because now they have a visual and when people read, I mean, or at least as a reader as well, I visualize what I'm reading. So when I write, I want the reader to visualize what they're reading and to feel like they're in that place and, and to see that. And so I, I do that in my book trailers as well to give them an idea. So before they even read the book, they have an idea, oh, okay, this looks interesting in this place. And, you know, and to inform the reader about the place without giving them a history lesson, you know? Because uh, I, I know sometimes I can be a little more, because <laughs> history is also one of my favorite things as well. So I, I put a little bit of history in it, but just just enough. I hope book authors out there are listening. I mean, they need to contact you up. Uh, we'll put what information and what other, what information you want that um, if people wanted to not only buy the books, but the the trailer. And let's note also that you are a book. This is our second ever book reviewer <laughs> so i mean ah. and i think i think that's that should be noted that you guys are in the ecosystem of the publishing book uh self-publishing and and traditional publishing community are very very important yes and there's lots of publishers who are hybrids uh, as well that maybe they do both so, and I'm, I'm trying to get to the point where I will start publishing other people as well as myself. So that other people whose stories need to be out there and they need to get out there and maybe don't want to self-publish or maybe afraid of it, that they can tell their story and I will help them tell their story. I have two people that I'm looking at right now in publishing and one of the ladies uh, is not far from here and she writes mainly on uh, Tumblr and she puts her stories up there and uh, her first name is Yvonne. I don't know her, her, her full pen name if she's going to change it or not, but she writes really good stories that are just, 
you know, that makes you also use your senses, you know. So it would be, she would be, she's right on brand with me. So I'll have to introduce her and I would like to publish her stories and get them out there as well. So, because I'm really, I really love promoting other people and not just myself. So I, I get a joy from it. It's just like a high, especially when I read it and I get excited about their books. So I like to share. So I automatically do that with a lot of authors and a lot of books that I read because I'm, you know, not just author and publisher, but reader and just reading the stories and getting excited about other people's stories and like helping them get out there as well. Because a lot of people are unknown, but if you get their stories out, then it makes, you know, that there are people who love to read and they have an entire library of different authors, not just one. So there's more for everybody. Awesome. Let me ask you this. I, I, I'm, I'm going to see if my hunch is correct. Are you always, already a screenwriter? No, I, but I'm, I'm I was saying, incorrect. I, yeah. I was, I'm trying to learn because I would like to have my books in, on film and as well as maybe do some writing because I love movies. That's my, right. my second mom. Right. Uh, second to books, I love movies. Because I'm wondering, thinking here, what is the actual difference, uh, distinction between being a book author and you coming up with these creating these characters as opposed to being a screen screenwriter i guess maybe it's it's the dynamic of you had to really pinpoint the story a little bit more as a screenwriter because you have a, 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 you you know, a, a limited time to tell things yes and a screenwriter will tell you if you know your script has to show what's in the scene not just the people the characters but like the background the if there's a can of coke or if there's that you know if they're in the kitchen what's in the kitchen what does the kitchen look like and because i already have that mindset to describe everything that is in the room and everything that's going on in that scene a, re a screenwriter takes it at another level and adds more to it so that you can picture this scene and you can actually film this scene from everything that what maybe the actors are doing to how they're feeling to show those emotions, they convey those things. And then you've got the setting. So it really brings everything kind of together. And like I said, just screenwriting is like a step above writing books and novels. So it, it would, you know, so far it's been a little bit of a challenge, but actually I like it because I want to actually do that. And, you know, your shots coming in, what you focus on, you know, there's a zoom in in certain areas or you zoom into the character's face when there's a deep emotion. Uh, things like that. So you would have to write that into the script. Wow, wow, wow. Um, what do you think about books and movies? As we're talking to, a, a, I guess, an expert book author. What, what, what is your opinion and thought on the importance of film? Or do you feel important that film is necessary in, in order to explain the book more? Oh, what, what is I think thing? books are more detailed than what they tell in film because <laughs> you just don't have the time. I mean, who would sit for a three hour film, you know, <laughs> to tell everything and every aspect of, of, you know, the book. But for the most part, people who don't like to read, well, here's their chance to experience a book that, you know, maybe they're not good at reading, but they see it on film and that would introduce them to this story of, that they otherwise would not know about. And I believe that a lot of films are crucial to the survival of books uh, and their and survival of film in general, because you have now more movies that are based on books or best-selling books that uh, otherwise people wouldn't know about or they're hidden gems that you would actually see on film now. And I think that that's great because more movie makers are going to authors and asking for their stories, you know, or, or looking at books more or less to put on to film. And Harry Potter being a huge one for that, for books that otherwise, you know, it would just, it would have remained where it was in the book world, which was pretty big, but even more so because of the film. So I, I think that would be the next step for a lot of people. And I, I would love to see some of my favorite authors uh, even on film, which would be better, you know, cause it's like, I, I got to see it in my head and then to see it in production is like a huge thing. Because I, I was raised on comic books, and so uh, I love Marvel, Marvel Universe, and I love seeing the things that, and the characters that I fell in love with as a kid 
on screen live and in front of me, you know, so that that was like a huge thing. So even though I know comic books aren't books to some people, but they were from my childhood that I characters that I grew up in wanted to aspire to be super in, in some way at, or, you know, help others and, you know, have that kind of uh, mentality from reading these comic books, you know, and not being maybe all powerful, but there are other ways that it taught me how to, that I have my own superpower. So I thought that was really great and, uh, you know, sad about Stan Lee. And I definitely miss, you know, seeing him pop up in the movies, but yeah, that it's books to film. That's this, it's definitely way. Cause there are people who never picked up a comic book in their life who now love, you know, the idea of Marvel Universe because it became a film and a whole film franchise. Now, what do you think about auto books? I mean, and I say that, let me, the caveat is that, um, I can't take from my mother that's 78 and I know for like seven months or so she was in assistant living and she actually needed that time. My dad had passed and she mm -hmm. was a caretaker for my dad and I came and helped as, my, as well. But um, what I noticed is that they are at a certain age that, that to sit down and just read a book, it may be a little too much. But if they can just right. hear hear the book, hear the book, that works for them. And that and and, and think I would think also that if they had some type of illness or something, or ailment or whatever, that if that would take their mind off of, it. yes, uh, they I just heard on that one. And then also kids as well, you know, kids. Yeah. I mean, kids just to introduce them to books, and then then they would go on later to read books. Oh, I like listening to books. Oh, now I want to read. I actually want to get the experience of reading, but what, what are you, I'm just talking, but what, what are your thoughts on, on, on the auto books? No, I, I agree it, because a lot of people are busy or don't have the time to sit down and read, but they can listen. They can listen as they drive. They can listen while they're doing tours around the house or anything like that. And it brings the book to life for them. And that's why I do have an audio book of one of my, my best book, uh, Leonessa. And I actually got a narrator who, lived or spent time in West Africa um, and he's Welsh but he does these accents so well that, and he's very engaging that many people who listen to the book are like oh my goodness this is you know this really brought everything together for them so I think I will make more audiobooks of my since I have 14 so it's it's a process with each one so I'm gonna try to do as many as I can but I would I love for you know, audiobooks to be there because there are things that sometimes I'm doing. And if I'm listening to a book and one of my favorite authors is um, Laurel K. Hamilton, and I love her Anita, excuse me, her Anita stories who, um, she's a, like a necromancer and she brings the dead back to life, but she does it. She's also part of a law enforcement group. So things like that. So it was uh, great to hear all of her books on audio while I'm doing other things. And I got to keep up with the series because she says like, what, 28 now? <laughs> but, uh, and that series is still ongoing. And then her Anita Blake series is, I'm sorry, that's what it is. She's uh, Anita Blake. And it was really interesting to hear it. And she's got so many different characters and then have the one person do all these character voices. And now I could see and hear the characters, not just read them. And so they came more to life for me. So that's another thing. Audiobooks are great. And I highly recommend authors that are considering it. Yes, please consider it and do it because uh, it's, it's an added bonus just for people who, again, don't like to read, but have the time to listen. They kind of so want to be you another option. Right. And they want to be, they want to be connected with that creativity. Yes. Now, what is your thoughts on between, because I, I see, you, you know, value your opinion, getting to know you, um, getting to know you. Um, what is your, what are your thoughts of traditional versus self-publishing? What, what are your thoughts there? Um, obviously, I'm a little biased. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. self-published, but mm -hmm. uh, had, I guess, traditional publishing is great, and for people who don't have the time to do things on their own would you know but if you are a new 
author and you're not well known, it's a little less likely for a traditional publisher to uh, get your opinion, you know, to try to sell your work. And, and for a traditional <laughs> publisher, the bottom line is making those sales. Right. So for someone very new, it's difficult to try to say, oh, well, do you think this is going to be a good idea? Or, you know, they, they get thousands of manuscripts daily. So, and now it's, you know, through email. Traditionally, because of their idea of what romance was or is, I'm glad that I didn't get it done that way because this self-publishing allowed me to use my own voice unedited, unfiltered, right. and it worked. Right. So people were real. They liked the realness of my books and it wasn't so, it didn't follow a familiar pattern. And for new authors who don't follow a familiar pattern, I would say it's better to be self-published or find someone who is a hybrid publisher mm -hmm. who maybe mm -hmm. will take a chance mm -hmm. on your work because you, you are new, but it's something different because even readers, we look for that's what started me writing is because I couldn't find always what I wanted to read. Mm. So I began to write what I wanted to read. And so for most, a lot of authors, that's, that's also true with them. And when it's good to have experimental or new authors and different on different subjects that have just, you know, broadened people's minds, period, because they wouldn't think uh, now we have um, reverse harem where there's, a woman who has more than one partner, male partners. Okay. And they call it a reverse harem because, you know, it's, you know, men have their harems, you know, you've got all these sheiks and all these, you know. So yep. now you have reverse harem where a woman will have three or more partners. Okay. Know, partners which is really okay. interesting. Yes. And it can go so far, you know, but again, right. it's, it was considered taboo, you know, 10, right. 10 12 years ago. So mm -hmm. it's, now more open and people are more you have more readers for that okay Same thing, and more people since i mean i will say 50 shades in a lot as as far as opening regular people to experiment with things that, that are out there that maybe they didn't know about now they do know a little bit more about it and maybe don't judge it the same way and right. maybe it will open up something in them or at least make things more exciting in the bedroom for married couples you know so right. or even people who are not, but who need a little more spice. So it's, it's a good way to open up ideas for things. And so traditional may not have, you know, someone took a chance on that, you know, on that author to even get that story out. And it became a three movies series. So, yeah, I would definitely say if you have something avant-garde or different, I would go with self-publishing. And there are people who help you self-publishing that are not, uh, that charge you a whole lot. Um, because a lot of things, you just have to be careful uh, as far as your book rights and keeping your book rights. And that's one thing about self-publishing that I like. Uh, I have my own ISBN numbers. Uh, I do not have, I do not get them assigned by Amazon because that way I can sell to any retailer, any book retailer. And I am the publisher and I get to keep the rights to those. Whereas you get an assigned one, well, then Amazon has the rights to those to your book or whoever you get to publish your book. And if you want to have that control over your work, I would say definitely self-publishing is the way to go. But for traditional, they have, you have more access to marketing and things of those nature where you are not doing it yourself. But then there are lots of promoters. I've met wonderful people who promote other promote authors and get their work out there for them. You have PAs, you have personal assistants who are just, I mean, just invaluable. And you have um, beta readers, people who are, they'll read your book for free just to tell you what to think about it. And that also helps you to learn, okay, is this book going to be a hit? Is it, you know, what do I need to do differently? And beta readers, are, they just love to read. And you know, they, so they're, they're in it for, I get the first copy, you know, so they're excited <laughs> about that. And they really like, you know, especially they really like your work and they will help you to do a lot of things. So if you want to go the self-publishing route, there are lots of independent authors who we're called indie authors who uh, will help at any turn for anything. And we'll gladly give information and places where you can go that's not expensive for the covers or for the things that you want to do. 
uh, and in getting your work out and in marketing. And there are people who are just sole promoters who really are just fantastic at what they do and they don't charge a whole lot. And they, they really do a phenomenal job there. I've known indie authors who have made best selling like over and over. Once they start with one, it's like everything they've written after that became a bestseller. So it's just, you know, there's so much out there, but I, I would say if you definitely want to be, you know, published, consider both, you know, so see which one works better for you. So there's, there's people out there um, that you said that are book promoters that would actually get your book in front of, um, in front of the intended readers. Yes. Okay. There are, there yeah. are several um, that will actually go through and send it to different book groups and just really promote your work for you so that you don't have to do it. And it's, uh, it's automatic. They, and they love what they do and they really get into it. And it, you know, it, this is some of these people, they do it full time and they're really good at it. And I've learned through trial and error since 2009, how to do this myself, which right. is why I really like doing it for others and the radio show. And that was the whole premise to bring other authors with me and show them and their work to audience that may have never, you know, would have never otherwise heard about them. I can tell the audience, I think you better watch your program so you can you can really get a chance to learn um, more outside of just being the book author. Um, and the, the, the gentleman I told you before, I think one time I talked to you before, um, that sold over a hundred and like 87,000 books, or whatever. Books, yes. Yeah. So I definitely want to connect you. You know, he's, he's, he's offered author about... Uh, I'm going to say four, five, six books. So I think he would be a great guest and mm -hmm. talk and see what's going on. Um, what, what do you have to say for the young, to, to, to new people? I mean, and when we say new, I actually had an author. This is, you know, interesting and inspired a whole lot of people. Um, jazz great that I had on the program that wrote his first book at 81. And then another Gosh. lady that's, about, I'm 52 that wrote her book. She's around, around my age, her first book. So it's not just an age thing, but what do you say to people that are, that want to be authors? What we, what, and, especially, and, all, and I guess, especially young people, what, what, is, what would your message be to them? I would say, go for it. Do, you know, don't stop to think, okay, is this going to be well received or not? because there are readers for every author. And I, I say that, I don't say that lightly because it is so true. There are so many different readers for, and, and it doesn't matter what you may like or someone will always, there's, there will always be someone that'll like what you have to say. And sometimes in, you know, on certain, you know, uh, nonfiction books, there will always be someone that needs to hear what you have to say because it applies to their life. And I would say, go for it, write it, submit it, publish it, get it out there because you never know who's gonna need it, who you're going to inspire, who is going to take your book to the next level, who is going to really need your book. So not whether you write nonfiction, whether you write fiction, someone is going to love it because there are just, there's, every, there's readers for every author. There's just so many, and it's, and it's a huge, no matter what genre you write in, there's always someone, you know, that, that thinks outside of the box and that will take your work and just run with it. So I would say, don't be shy about it. Just, you know, go ahead and, and, and get yourself out there. Definitely. And outside of this, <laughs> coming to the close, I guess you could talk forever, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, <laughs> but, but, you know, we, okay. So, so outside of just the influence of the person, I think relative that, that inspired you, what made you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going, I'm, I have something to say, and especially your type of writing. Look, I, I can't find reading and that was, that's inspiring. I can't find anything that's really speaking to me. I have to if for no other reason, just uh, from a, a healing standpoint, I have to get this out. And I know others may be 
you know, in the same um, space. That's what I'm gonna put say, in, in a beautiful space. But uh, mm -hmm. let's put it there. It's a beautiful space. But what said what told you say said to you and caused you to say I'm I'm going to do this. I'm going for it. My sister Heidi, my late sister, she really, uh, really pushed me because she she loved my stories that I would tell her. And for, you know, I wanted to do what she asked me to do. And she said, well, she basically told me I just need to get off my butt and do it. So, <laughs> and, you know, that she, and she also told me, you know, you, you never know who's going to read it and be inspired by it. So. Uh, that 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 was just after she passed. I really became serious about publishing and deciding. Okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to go for it. And if you know, I kind of tested the waters a little bit with my blog at the time. You know, when blogging was a big thing, uh, and people liked the stories, the little short stories that I would put on there. So that kind of gave me a little, a little more like okay, confidence. Okay, okay. So they like that. So all right, I can do this. So, and that's what made me really step out. So it was between my sister and just kind of testing the waters a bit. And I just, I have something to say. And I didn't think I did until I actually put it out there. And I've been told many times that people have liked my stories or how it helped them in some way, or, or they tried something that I wrote about uh, in my story and that it really helped them with a husband and wife that wasn't paying attention or, and it's great to hear those things because it's like, oh, okay, so what I said made a difference. And that's, that was really big for me because I thought, well, maybe no one else thinks this way. Maybe it's just me. But apparently there are lots of people who think the same way I do. So it was, it was great to have that. Yeah. And I, I do not regret at all stepping out and just saying, okay, here it goes. <laughs> so sometimes it's just the hardest thing is just taking that first step. Yeah, and what is the feeling for for people that <laughs> I mean fantasize? I'm I'm assuming, and even authors we fantasize. What is the feeling of being an author? What does it feel like? Um, it's exciting, kind of nerve wracking sometimes because you know I I grew up really shy and and afraid to speak most of the time, so I was a very quiet kid and teenager. And it wasn't until I joined the military that I actually started learning to use my voice and not be afraid of it so it was uh, it's kind of exciting and you're kind of on pins and needles like okay I like this but is anyone else gonna like it and sometimes you have those moments of doubt like I don't think this is gonna right this is not this does not sound good or what it doesn't sound well and um that's when I have to shut those you know doubtful thoughts that come to you you kind of have to shut them down and just say you know what it is what it is, and this is the story I have to tell. And for some people, it may, you know, even if it's just for a small percentage, that small percentage needed that book. So it doesn't matter how big or how little. Even if it's one person that said, hey, your book really hit me, that's the excitement. That, that's the part that makes me excited about putting out new books. And say, hey, I really identify with that, or I identify with that character. I know what she feels like. I know what she went through, and that's that's the big that's the big reward for me. For it's you know, for me, it's not all about acclamation or or, or even money. It's that feeling of knowing that I helped someone, that I made their day, or I gave them a solution to something that they didn't think that they could do, or they didn't think they had the courage to do it. And if I could do it, they can too. So that's the big thing for me. Now, and, oh my, I got to stop, but I'm, I'm just, I'm so intrigued, um, but, but, so when you meet people, how does that make you feel when you say, I'm a book author to general people, and how does that, do you, do you feel like a role model when younger ladies or younger men, let's say in particular, I guess, young, younger ladies, you know, mm -hmm. look up to you, um, just tell all of, tell us about all of that. It's just it's interesting. It's pretty interesting to you know when I tell people that I when they ask me what I do, I'm like, well, I'm an author, and most people are just like, oh wow, a real life author. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm not that big. I mean, you know, but to me, it's you know, it's 
kind of humbling because I see how excited they get. And it's like, oh, but I'm just a regular person like you. I just have creative ideas. That's all, you know, and it, you know, for me, it, it's funny to see someone like I've had people quote unquote fangirling over me. And I'm like, you really like my books that much? It just, <laughs> it, it floors me every time because I'm not expecting them to do that. So it's fun to see that and to see the excitement in their eyes. And that makes me more excited. But uh, mostly I've met some really young authors. I've met an author who was 12 years old and she's got her whole series. And wow. for me, that was exciting. I was like, hey, this little girl, she is really just, you know, she has her stories together. At 12, I was writing poetry and I wasn't even thinking about publishing. And here she is a published author of 12 books, you know, and she's 12 years old. So <laughs> to me, it's, it's incredibly amazing to see that. And to have myself be a role model, where I have one children's book, My Rainbow Place, and that to me it probably is more exciting and to see kids light up when they're reading my book. And I wrote that book under K.R. Vance, so it's a different pen name. And because the book was about my children, so who are biracial children. So that's where the rainbow came in because they are different shades. And it's the, rain the human colors, not just the regular rainbow. So to, to be that and to have kids come up to you and say they like your book too, those, those are things that, that, that's really exciting for me. And I also got to read my book in different schools and I got to go to classrooms of my children's classrooms and read the books to them. So wow. for that part was really exciting for me to do and go to libraries during story hour and be able to read to the kids, you know, that they, they had never seen it. The person who read, who wrote the book is actually reading the book to them. And that was really exciting for me because it was, you know, just to see them get that excited and like, wow, you really wrote this book. And they were so excited and it asked me about the pictures and, and we're, and so I would take my kids with me sometimes to show them because I wrote this, the, the book in 2007. So they were really young when I wrote the book. So they're immortalized forever. And now they have these kids, young kids coming to be like, oh, you're in this book, you're in this book. And they want them to sign the books or, you know, or things like that. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And it's a lot of fun. And I never thought of myself as a role model until I actually started putting my stuff out there. And then you become, so you really have to be responsible for what you do put out because people are looking up, up to you, whether they're younger or even older. It, it really doesn't matter because they're looking at you as this person who has done this incredible thing as something they can hold in their hand. And, you know, most people read on Kindles, but you know, I'm still old school. I like to have a book in my hand where I could see, you know, and smell the book and I can read it, you know? So it's exciting for people to acknowledge that and they get excited meeting you because they're like, oh, well, you're an author. And like, yeah, I haven't been on any big tours or anything, but that you are accessible. And I think that's, you know, the big thing is that they are, you are accessible to them. And I think that's exciting for them. And it's exciting for me to be able to be that. So it, I still sometimes can't believe it as far as people hyping up or being excited or fangirling because it's just, I don't think about it that way. I'm just like a person who wrote my ideas down and uh, for other people to read. And so I, I'm putting myself out there and for, and for a person who was very shy and has some anxiety issues, that was a big step. So, yeah. And of course, I'm, I'm, not everybody's positive. So, you know, <laughs> well, yeah. you didn't like my book. Well, it just, I guess it just wasn't for you. But, and you'll get that, you know, they'll, there are people who will just, they don't understand it or they don't, you know, for whatever reason. And, and that's, that's their opinion. You know, that's, it's not for everybody. Yeah, well, I'm impressed. And I'm sure that the audience will be impressed. The, the LinkedIn fan base will be impressed. And other people that are fan base will be impressed as well. Um. <laughs> Yeah, so what's my thought? Yeah, I just have to say this before closing that that I sense that you would be wonderful also and and I guess maybe we, in your show you probably do it kind of educating since you're you're gonna you're yes. you're a publisher kind of educating people a little bit about the book about being a book author and about the book world and things of that and things along those lines. And then I definitely want to urge that you I feel it would be interesting to have a documentary, film documentary, um, mm -hmm. on the topics that are dear to you in terms of the interracial 
relationships that can make people understand and and not be ignorant and and see right. the humanity of it. So I'm definitely looking forward to that when that comes because I think you're gonna yes give us that. That's great. And your travels when you when you do your 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 your, your filming and then you write your books and and I have to say that the the, the second third fourth fifth Spanish book <laughs> that that's in the horizon. And so now, so basically tell us where we, I guess we close. I know you're a busy person. So tell us where can, where, where can they find you and learn more and become a fan and definitely uh, purchase your material and just learn more about you and watch your show and also be to get their books um, reviewed and also the, where they can go to find out in order to get a trailer, book trailer, okay. all these things. I have a website, it's mahoganysilverrain.net, where it mainly encompasses everything from my uh, show to my books and where you can purchase them. Uh, mostly on, there's Amazon, I'm on Kobu, Barnes and Noble for my books that are in print. And I, I have very few that are just Kindle, but I do have one book that is in all three. It's in print, it's on Kindle, and it's an audio book, and that's Passions uh, Pride. Vanessa, Leonessa, excuse me. And you can find uh, my author page on Amazon as well. And it will show you other places where you can find the books and list them where you can buy the books, even my older versions. And you can also find me, uh, Mahogany Says, on Blog Talk Radio, uh, slash Mahogany Says, blogtalkradio.com. I'm also on Anchor FM, Mahogany Says. Um, I, Apple Podcast, um, iHeartRadio, Google Podcast as well, where you can listen to the show, um, Spotify as well, under Mahogany Says for the show. And for book trailers or anything, you can reach me at mahoganysilverine uh, at gmail.com. So if you're, if anyone's interested in, or any authors interested in getting a book trailer made for them, or even a commercial that I can run on my show, uh, I do live commercials as well, and I record them for sponsoring other people's books and promotions. So just let me know. Um, you can reach me at mahoganysilverain at gmail.com. Great. And I just to hear you talk again. Is there anything else you want to leave the public with in final words? Uh, final words. Um, if you're for this, for this author, interview, you know, for, for this, this interview, interview, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you're an aspiring author, you know, don't be afraid to step out and do it. Um, even if you're thinking about getting into media or, or screenwriting as well for authors who are pretty seasoned and know what they want to do, be open to having your books become a movie. I mean, it's, screenwriting is, is one of the things I'm learning in the process of learning how to do so that I can do that. And it's, I think it's probably the next step for any author to look at, you know, not just be in print, but also be, you know, in film or maybe even a TV show or TV series, especially people who have different series. And I have three series uh, in my collection, the 14 books. So three of them are series. And uh, I look forward to my new books coming out, uh, hopefully at the end of this year and beginning of next year. So this, cause it's been a kind of a, a difficult year for everybody and, you know, with COVID and, but things are settling down. So we'll be back to maybe doing in-person book signings and stuff like that. So I'm looking forward to that and getting back out in public. I have to be greedy for the public. You just, I just have to, I, I know, <laughs> I, I, how was it for you, a professional book author and media personality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, during COVID? We had learned whole new ways of doing it. <laughs> uh, I had more Zoom uh, book signings, and but it, it made it easier to kind of connect with my readers and audiences more upfront where they could actually ask me questions or things they wanted to know or about the books and about the characters. And we did several of those uh, last year and this year. And I really enjoyed doing those because it actually gave us a chance to meet with people that we wouldn't otherwise meet with or couldn't get out to see or and people overseas and actually open that up to because maybe I was limited to the city I live in or you know things of that nature but I was able to reach other people and I do have listeners uh, 
a very small percentage in India as well as uh, Ireland, and not in addition to West Africa. So it's been enabled me to reach a larger, a much larger audience that way. So uh, in a way, it was kind of I'm kind of grateful that we were actually able to do these things while COVID was, you know, so people could watch from the safety of their homes, but they also were able to talk and interact with someone they admire or reading some books they've read. And so I think it was very helpful because people went back to reading because they were home, you know, who didn't get a chance to read and then they worked from home. So now they could also have that chance to read again. And I think it did a lot for the book industry by us being at home like that. Wow. I have to go here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But but did anybody um in your family are our friends, our associates passed from COVID that you know of. And and then the last, last question would would be, did the whole occurrence of of COVID-19 inspired any works of any kind? And those are the last questions. Okay, <laughs> uh, no problem. <laughs> yeah. uh, I not had anyone in my family pass from COVID, um, no Good. close friends of mine that I know personally. However, my dad passed away this year from a brain tumor. And that's Sorry, another reason I'm here in Colorado and I came to take care of him and help him. So that's yeah. how I got here. Right. But I, um, it has affected a lot of people and I, and I see the devastation from it. And being with my dad in the hospital and going through him with, with treatment and you know seeing other people there and everyone was masked up and there were things that you know I couldn't walk around without a mask. And to see that up close, being at the hospital every day, that did make it a difference for me. And it made it more real for me. So it's difficult when people say they don't want to get the vaccine or that, you know, on one side or the other. But I've seen people in the hospital and I've seen how it's affected people. So, yes, I would definitely say if you can get the vaccine, you know, it. but if you don't, don't. If you don't want it, don't. But it is a very real thing and it has affected all of us. And even if it, I didn't have anyone personally I know pass away, it still affects and by being in that hospital every day and seeing everyone, yes, it, I can see the effects of that. So, and your final question, did it inspire any writing? Um, Films, not, any, you know, any type anything. of creative, any type of creative things that, because I see screenwriter, film person, I see so many things inside and that's in you. So did it, would mm -hmm. it, did it affect any future works that we may, I guess, benefit from and learn? I think it, on some people it, it did affect, I was kind of down, I, I, I kind of, my creativity was a little stifled for a little while uh, because of just, you know, and being here with my dad and stuff, I started out trying to, but I couldn't keep up with everything. And it, it kind of brought me down a little bit. So I wasn't able to write like I wanted to. And so the fact that I'm back to writing right now is great because for a few months there, and he passed away in May so of this year, so I have not been able to, you know, if I'm finally getting to the point where I'm back to writing and back to being more creative and back to doing my videos, back to doing my show and, and talking to people and getting myself back out. So it, for a little while it affected me, but um, I'm back at it. It doesn't stay down for long, so you gotta keep going. And I remember my grandfather again, keep going keep pushing, you push past the rough things and you look forward, you just gotta keep keep walking, keep moving, don't stop, just keep going. Yeah, it's just amazing how we started kind of talking about your grandfather and, the, and what was instilled and then we ended on the note mm -hmm. of you sharing again what he instilled in you and now you're passing that on to, to the world and, and, and viewers out there. So it's amazing how things can really, positive things can sometimes stick to us, stick yes. with us. Yeah. So people, it's been quite an interview um, and I'm sure, and, and so we're blessed that she was able to come on the show, that she came on the show and really shared with you. And I hope that the audience really learned a lot from somebody who's a successful book author, especially black women, and in all races and all genders so again we appreciate you coming on the show and and thank you and anytime you. that you have a book 
that comes out, if you want to come on the show, you are definitely welcome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So we'll end the show, people. Uh, um, American authors and others out there. And I'll just talk to her briefly for a second after the show. But watch this video, share it, subscribe, and definitely learn. Because um, this has definitely been an enriching experience. Until next time, we'll see you again next time on American Authors and Others. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>